Hello, everyone. My name is Danielle, and you are listening to The Best Medicine. Um, today, we have my friend, Nicole Powell Cantu. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Danielle. Um, I appreciate you inviting me on to talk with you about what to expect from therapy. And um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Texas, and I treat individual adults. And um, some of the issues I commonly treat are depression, anxiety, and childhood trauma, and ADHD. Yeah. So today we're here to talk about what to expect from therapy. So what should we expect, Nicole? Well, um, if you've never been in therapy before, it can be a little bit intimidating um, going into it. And so um, I recommend that anyone starting out um, pay attention to how they're feeling when they're talking to a potential therapist. Um, many therapists offer a free consultation, maybe 15 minutes, 30 minutes, um, a phone call to, to talk to each other and see if it's a good fit on both sides. Um, so it's helpful to notice if you're feeling comfortable, if you're feeling like it is a good fit, um, because that's really important with a therapist. Um, therapists all have different um, modalities, like approaches to treatment that they use, but if you're not feeling comfortable or feeling like you have a relationship with that therapist, um, then, you know, the rest of those things really won't work as well. Like that's the most important ingredient for therapy to be successful. I've definitely had situations where I felt like a therapist was just not a good fit. It just, like, what do you do when you feel like the therapist isn't a good fit? Well, I mean, I think first off, um, it can be helpful to talk to the therapist about it and say like, hey, I noticed I'm feeling uncomfortable um, and, you know, address it with them out in the open, um, work through any tension that you're noticing um, in the room, those sorts of things. And then, um, you know, if you're continuing to feel uncomfortable, you can look at switching to another therapist potentially, because um, it really is important just to make sure that you find somebody you feel like is a good fit. Yeah, um, cause it's like, I could definitely say that um, I've had situations where I had to fire my therapist and, you know, I talk to new ones about the old one and it's just so strange, but it helps you, helps you realize that you're self-advocating. You're talking about what you do need and what past therapy hasn't get hasn't given you and what new and you learn what new therapy can give you yeah I think that's a really helpful conversation to have with a new therapist in fact I ask all my new clients that at our first visit um, I ask have they been in therapy before and if so how was that experience for them and that um, gives me a lot of helpful information because if it was a positive experience, then they can tell me what they liked about it and what they found helpful. And I can keep those things in mind and you know, try to incorporate that into our work together. Um, and then on the other hand, if they had a negative experience, they can tell me what they didn't like about that other therapist's approach or you know what wasn't really working for them. And so, um, you know, regardless, it's, it's really helpful for me. Yeah. So I feel like I sometimes have trouble expressing disagreement with my therapist like I don't agree with their analysis about a problem that I have or their solution to a problem that I have or you know yeah what do I do yeah well I'm glad you brought that up Danielle it's perfectly reasonable for you to tell your therapist that you don't agree with them um, and that you feel like maybe they're not understanding where you're coming from or, you know, what they're saying to you isn't the most helpful. Um, it can feel really uncomfortable to say that. Um, a lot of people think that they, the therapist is the expert, right? Like they're the, the mental health professional. And so some people feel like, okay, well, I can't disagree with them. Um, you know, I should defer to their expertise. But the, the fact is that um, I have some expertise in mental health, but I'm not an expert on my clients' lives. Like they're the ones that know best um, what feels right for them. And so 
you know, we want to a lot of times work on them trusting themselves more and looking inward to decide what's right for them. So, um, you know, in that safe relationship with a therapist, that can be a really good opportunity for clients to start um, practicing some new skills. And so that can include assertiveness, speaking up for themselves or expressing disagreement, even if it hasn't felt safe in other relationships in their lives. And that can um, bring a lot of potential for growth. Absolutely. Um, there's another question here on my mind. Um, sometimes I feel like my therapist is doubting me or judging me. Like, and I can't, I can't pinpoint what she does or uh, to do that. But you know, what what should I do if I feel that way? That's another great thing to just bring up and just talk about, just get it out in the open and say, like, hey, I'm feeling judged right now. And then you and your therapist can talk about, okay, well, where are those feelings come from? Um, and, um, you know, is, is your therapist actually judging you? Which it's possible, um, but, you know, most therapists strive to be really non-judgmental and compassionate and accepting toward their clients. And so, um, you know, there might also be something involved um, based on your past um, relationship dynamics, maybe growing up or with other people in your life, other experiences um, that's led you to interpret what they're doing as judgmental when really they didn't mean that. And so bringing it up is an opportunity for y'all to um, clear that up together and for the therapist to clarify what their actual intention was or how they were meaning to come across. Um, so that's, you know, it's all, it's all relevant. It's all helpful to just bring up and talk about out in the open. Yeah. I mean, I've definitely had situations in my, in my career where I had to keep it to myself, like, and just moderate my own reactions when I had an experience from, uh, of my own that was a client reminded me of. And you know, it's, it's part of, part of, you know, being there is to like, think about, hmm, okay, I'm in this moment, which is not the same as the clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, um, in, in a way it can help you learn to stay present by being in this profession, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are some people who say things like, you know, I regularly look at my partner's face and I interpret it as angry and then I'll ask them are they angry with me and they'll tell me they aren't angry um and you know I, I I believe that they mean it and so um you know it makes people start to recognize like okay I have this pattern of interpreting someone's face as angry when it's actually not and so it's sort of like um uh a, a test for yourself, you know, like a reality check, um, in, in the, in the kindest sense, of course, but, you know, to, to realize like, okay, I'm interpreting this person's face as a threat when there really is no threat and they can start to adjust how they're interpreting it. Um, so that can be helpful or like maybe the person's upset, but it, it's about something that has nothing to do with them. Like they just had a bad day. So, you know, all of that is, um, helpful to talk about in therapy too, similar to the the interpretation of the therapist's, you know, facial expressions and what they're saying. Yeah. So there's a point like um, in therapy where you just feel like you, you might feel like you're, you're not making any progress. Um, what should you do about that? Well, um, you know, I think that's something helpful to talk about with the therapist as well, um, to bring it up and say, like, I'm feeling frustrated with this process and I'm not really making progress like I was hoping and try to figure out what's getting in the way of that. Um, like, is it a motivation issue? Is it um, feeling discouraged because of setbacks um, that you didn't anticipate? Um, is it that you feel like that the therapist approach isn't really helping you? So that can be helpful to talk about too. There can be a lot of reasons for that. Yeah. Um Sometimes I found, you know, I've outgrown a therapist style and sometimes there's certain strategies that a therapist can use that might make me feel like controlled or obligated or anything like that. And that's also something to check in with myself about. But 
also it's very important to you know voice that right yeah yeah it is and maybe it is a good time to move on and to work with someone else at that point so yeah just bring it up and talk about it that can be helpful and I mean it's so helpful too like there are some times that clients will essentially ghost their therapist like they just um decide they're done with therapy and they just disappear and don't really ever have a conversation about it and I really recommend that after you've decided to leave therapy you have at least one more session and that way you know you can talk with your therapist about um your work together and celebrate any progress that you've made and check in about where you're at with your goals at that time um, and talk through potential options for next steps. Um, and so that can be um, just a great opportunity to um, honor your work together and, you know, it brings closure for both of you and um, thinking through next steps. Um, so that, that's just a helpful part of the process. Yeah. And, you know, it brings up a bunch of different feelings when you're about to end with a client, whether it's long-term or short-term care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of sadness um, with it. Like it's, it can be um, some grief, just like there is with any other loss um, because, you know, clients and therapists a lot of times do develop a relationship with one another and um, you know, therapists, like we, we really care about our clients and want the best for them. And so I'm, I'm always sad to see my clients go. And um, it's a bittersweet thing when we have that final termination session, as we call it. Um, but also it's a good sign because I know that, you know, if I've been seeing clients and then they start to scale back um, in terms of the frequency of our sessions or eventually, you know, um, close out our therapy together. I know it's usually because they're um, getting better and they're feeling a lot better and they've made progress toward their goals. And so, um, you know, it's a positive thing that they don't necessarily feel like they need me anymore. So. Yeah. It's, you know, on one hand you get attached, but on the other hand you think, oh, well, it's so good that they don't need me anymore because it's like, you know, it's, it's so, it's, it's a different feeling as a, you know, a therapist than as a friend or whatever. Um, but on the other hand, you know, if it was, if it was just a friend, it's like, oh, well, they're out in the world, they're doing great things. And we had a, ma we had major influences on each other, even if the relationship is no more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, it touches my heart getting to work with my clients and like, I, I, I just feel so honored that they trust me with their issues and open up to me about um, things that feel very sensitive and very vulnerable for them. And um, yeah, and I, I learn a lot from them too. So um, yeah, it's, it's such a beautiful relationship. Yeah. So I had another question on here. There, yeah. I have a problem I'm struggling to change um, you know, and I kind of don't feel ready to change it. Um, should I start therapy or should I wait until I'm ready to change? I mean, it can still be helpful to come to therapy, even if you're feeling, um, uh, ambivalence about changing and you're like, not quite sure what you want to do, because you can talk about that in therapy. You can say like, well, I kind of want to do this, but I kind of don't. I have mixed feelings about it. Um, and so you can explore that with your therapist and they can maybe ask you, um, some thought provoking questions to help you think it through a bit more, um, and kind of clarify what it is that you want for yourself. Um, and then help you think through too, like from a problem solving standpoint, like, okay, if this is something you decide you want to do, you're committing to it, then like, let's think through what are some things that will help you be successful with it. And let's think about some potential setbacks. Um, you know, for example, like you're wanting to start to exercise more. Okay, if you do it in the evening, maybe when you get off work, you're gonna feel tired and you're gonna be inclined to think, okay, I'm gonna blow it off because I'm too tired. Like I'd rather just chill out instead, uh, relax. And so, uh, you know, we think about like possible setbacks like that, um, things that could get in the way of you being successful with your goal. and how you can plan for them. Um, so those kinds of things I think are, are very welcome in therapy. You don't have to be certain yet to 
you know, benefit from coming to therapy. Yeah. Sometimes there are barriers to, you know, the things that we want to do and it, that makes it hard. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so talking it through with a therapist can be very helpful. And one thing that a lot of people find beneficial about that process is that as opposed to talking to loved ones in your personal life, like family or friends, um, a therapist is sort of an outsider, sort of a neutral third party. And so um, everyone, you know, in our own lives, we all develop blind spots. And so having someone, uh, you know, with a fresh outside perspective can be really helpful. And I'm not going to be invested in my clients doing a certain thing in the same way that someone close to them might, because it doesn't affect me personally. Um, so I think that, um, you know, where if you go talk to someone in your personal life, you might get pressure to do a certain thing. Um, you know, you can, you're not going to get that in therapy. Yeah. They may think it's helping, but it's really ultimately not right. When you, when you tell them, oh, just do it. Just, just stop drinking alcohol. Stop having mm -hmm. risky sex. Stop doing marijuana, stuff like that. You know, well, it's not that simple. Yeah, that is an oversimplification of the problem and um, the reasons that someone might engage in some of those behaviors are complex. And um, yeah, so sometimes, you know, our loved ones might tell us things that are not so helpful because if it was that simple, then um, someone probably would have done it already. And yeah. there's obviously some benefits to that they're getting out of those behaviors or they wouldn't continue doing it. So that's something I also explore with clients sometimes is like, okay, what are you getting out of this? What are some of the positive things? What do you like about it? Um, that's obviously part of what's motivating them to continue engaging in it. Yeah, or it's coping because uh, in my, my past experience, um, I've struggled with overeating and sometimes things that I didn't even enjoy. Um, so it's not always about the substance, right? Not always, no. And I mean, I, you know, I don't know the details of your situation, of course, there's, I'm sure there's a lot there, but sometimes, um, you know, engaging in overeating for some people is soothing. So that can be a form of self-soothing. Um, the same as using substances like alcohol or drugs can be for a lot of people or um, other things that help people numb or avoid um, painful situations or difficult things, um, uncomfortable feelings, you know, um, that can include keeping yourself busy, becoming a workaholic, um, anything like that. So, you know, we would just explore, like, what is that behavior doing for you? Like, what keeps you coming back to it over and over? Yeah, and I can say that the most supportive thing, it, uh, the most supportive thing anybody can do is just be there, right? And, you know, not look at their reaction to stress, but look at their stress, right? look at the things that are contributing to their problem. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point because a lot of times um, there are underlying needs that we are trying to get met. And so maybe we meet those needs in a way that's not so healthy for us or that we feel some shame about. Um, and so, you know, the goal is to look at how can we meet those needs in a different way that feels healthier for you in the long term and that you can feel better about. Yeah. And the irony thing, the ironic thing is sometimes people engage in these self-sabotaging behaviors uh, because they feel shame and, you know, because they feel judged, because they feel like disapproved of, because they feel abandoned, because they feel guilt things like that and you know and being chastised for for all of that you can imagine how how rejected guilty ashamed you know so it's important to approach with acceptance and objectivity yeah absolutely i mean looking at the underlying feelings of shame or inadequacy or um insecurity um that's huge because you can just take away um, an unhealthy coping mechanism that someone's been using for a long time. But um, a lot of times they'll just replace it with another unhealthy coping mechanism unless you work to address 
the root of the problem like what yeah. what's lying underneath that yeah it's we don't want anybody at a greater risk because we take away their coping mechanism i mean the ideal would be that they would develop healthier coping mechanisms um and because we don't we know that this world's not going to be without stress and um difficult relationships are just you know that contribute to um stress are probably are not necessarily easy to resolve not necessarily easy to cut off not necessarily easy to set boundaries with because there may be a number of reasons that we don't um but yeah right yeah yeah absolutely and i'm not here to tell anyone um what is a problem for them or what they should change in their lives like i will look to my clients to see um what they feel is a problem for them um if there's um something that's a part of their life maybe a behavior um and they feel like it is hurting them in some way or they don't like it and they they want to change it then i will um follow their lead on that um but i'm not here to come in and say you need to change this thing because it's a problem um that obviously doesn't go over well i mean people are not motivated to do something just because someone else tells them to yeah so what would you do if you saw a glaring problem with a client situation and you knew that they didn't want to change it and they were refusing to change it for weeks, months, years, how would you feel as a therapist? I mean, you know, that can bring up some feelings of um, powerlessness and some frustration um, on my part, but um, I would be careful not to uh, impose that onto my client. I would just more um, ask them how they felt about, felt about the situation and, um, just explore their their feelings um, and you know start start where they're at. That's the important part. Oh yeah, I think that's that's super important. Um, we're running low on time right now, but I'm wondering if you had any um, final thoughts in our next about five to ten minutes. Final thoughts. Um, let me see here. Um, what did I want to mention? Um, I think it can be helpful to realize that um, we can't get all of our needs met uh, from any one individual person. And so you might have different people that you get different needs met from, and that's a healthy thing. And um, it's not realistic to expect to get um, all needs met by one person. I think uh, we get this idea from from Hollywood about relationships or from Disney um, that, you know, you meet this one person who's your soul need and then things are perfect and you just are perfect for each other and meet all of each other's needs. And I no think conflict. that gives, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no conflict. Yeah, everything's no, perfect. Once no you meet, ready, that's no it. Ready for, no ready for um, to to scream out the window with any of your connection. That's not realistic. Sometimes you do have tension and problems and mm -hmm. it's two to solve it. Yes, uh, yeah, exactly. Conflict is not a sign of a bad or unhealthy relationship. Um, conflict is normal. It's going to come up in any relationship and we can view it as an opportunity to learn more about each other and about ourselves and to work through it together in a, a healthy way. Um, and so, you know, thinking about how we manage conflict can be can be helpful, um, but it's not just this inherently bad thing, like a bad sign in a relationship. Um, and actually um, a lot of experts in long-term relationships and what makes healthy relationships uh, romantically um, say that conflict is a good sign really, because um, if you're in a relationship and you've stopped arguing and you just aren't really engaging and don't care anymore, then it's a sign that you've both kind of given up on the relationship. So arguing is actually kind of a good sign. It means you both care, you're both invested on some level. Um, so yeah, but I just, you know, I think having a realistic expectation about, you know, your partner, your romantic partner is not going to meet all of your needs and it's okay to, to get your needs met by different people and have a broader support circle. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that part. Absolutely. Absolutely. And 
it's also important to be your own best friend. I mean, that's a process it's to be self-compassionate and to learn, okay, I have these crazy thoughts in my head, but I'm not crazy. It's just, I'm just unique and wonderful. And so are the rest of the people in my life, come what may. Absolutely. I mean, we all have um, off the wall, strange thoughts go through our head from time to time, just pop into your head, like the same kind of thing you think about um, being in a crowded movie theater, for example, and having the urge to yell or to scream fire. Um, you know, people yes. like we, we all have thoughts that just pop into our head. That's normal. And, you know, we filter, we don't act on all of them. And that's the helpful part. And um, so, yeah, just knowing that's normal, because I think a lot of people are alarmed when they have intrusive, you know, what they deem to be strange thoughts. Um, they're very concerned and worried about what that says about them, but, you know, that's, yeah, that's a normal it, thing. It can be comedic sometimes. I, you know, I have a bunch of thoughts pop into my head, then I have it for my stand-up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and like, um, our thoughts, they're not reality. Like, we, we can think anything. Like you could have a thought like the sky is purple and then you know that's not true so i mean thoughts are not always telling us the truth and um sometimes we look to them as like the ultimate authority and they they feel like they hold a lot of power over us and so realizing that that they're just thoughts and kind of creating a little bit of distance from them can be really helpful absolutely yes um so we are out of time but i really appreciate uh, the time we spent together today Nicole, I hope we get uh, more time soon in the future. Um, uh, thank you again. Take care. Bye.